If you have your Bible, turn it to John, the fourth chapter. We are going to revisit a conversation that we got into last week with Jesus and the woman at the well. And today we're going to dig into the topic of living water. So this place in John 4, 13, Jesus is telling this lady, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him. Somebody say in him. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. I don't know if there's anyone in here that hated school as much as I hated school. But I did everything that I could to try to avoid going. Uh, there was a movie that came out when I was a kid that had a major influence on my life. It was called Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And so I took from him and used that as kind of a blueprint for my life, and I mapped out some even more creative ways of how to get out of going to school. Now, there are some of them that I'm not going to go into today because we have some students in the building, and I do not need you to blame me for your attendance issues. But I will give you one that's a little antiquated that would not work now because when I was in school, the teachers had something in their desk that was like this little strip and they would use it to check your temperature. And so they would place it on your forehead and it would go from green to yellow to red. And so when I was a kid, I had this motorcycle jacket. Uh, it was kind of like the jacket that you see the guys wear in Greece. You know what I'm talking about? It's got all the buckles everywhere. Except mine wasn't leather, it was pleather. It was pretty thick, and I would wear that to school. And what I would do is, I would go to the teacher. This is the first step. You go to the teacher and you say, listen, Miss Davis, I'm not feeling well today. And she'll say, do you need to go see the nurse? And your response is, no. I, would, I really don't want to have to go home. I think I can power through this. Do you mind if I just lay my head down for a little bit? And they say, absolutely, just go lay your head down. And that's when I would take my head and plant it into that pleather jacket, and I would just let it marinate. <laughs> now, over time, as I allowed it to marinate, I would think, okay, this is the moment, and I would immediately go to the teacher and say, I really don't feel good. I think that maybe you should check my temperature. She pulls out the little strip, and guess what? I've got a, a, a fever of 350 degrees. And she's like, oh, my goodness, like, you've got to get out of here. You're dying right now. And I'm like, okay, I think we can get someone to come get me. Now, just let me let you know this. Like, I was not a Christian when I was a child. And so I, I'm not doing that now. But so you got some grace for me. But I would do everything I could to try to avoid getting out of school, even though I had adults in my life that would tell me, Arm, one day you're going to miss all of this. Did anybody ever tell you that? One day you're going to wish you could go back and do it all over again. And I would think, no way. You do not understand how much I do not like being at school. But as I've gotten older, the fact is they were right. There are things I wish that I could go back and do again. There are things that I wish that I could go back and do differently. Anybody out there, show of hands, you wish you could go back and do some things differently, but I didn't listen. And so now when my kids complain about going to school, I'll tell them, hey, listen, I know I get you, but one day you're going to wish that you could go back. And I know they're not listening because I didn't listen because there's just something about us where we just want to figure it out on our own. I mean, have you ever heard like, hey, money won't buy happiness? And you're like, I'd like to try that. I'd like to weigh in with my own opinion here. We just want to figure things out on our own. There's, there's a time in King David's life where he's coming to the end of his life, and he has his son Solomon come, come to him, and he's going to give him some advice. He's going to tell him some things that he himself has learned through experience. There are some things that he wants Solomon to have, and there are some things that he wants Solomon to to avoid. And watch what he says here in 1 Kings, the second chapter, verse 1. This is David, the king of Israel. He's dying. He's on his deathbed. And he's talking to his son Solomon, who's going to be the next king of Israel. So it says, when David's time to die drew near, 
He commanded Solomon his son, saying, I am about to go the way of all the earth. Be strong and show yourself a man. And keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in his ways and keeping his statutes, his commandments, his rules, and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses. Why? So that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. David's wanting Solomon to know, listen, if you'll walk with God, you'll experience the favor and the blessing of God. And so as Solomon steps in and takes over the kingdom of Israel, he starts off strong. He starts off well. He's walking with God. He's being led by God. And now he's experiencing the favor of God. Not only does God make Solomon the wisest man to walk the earth, he also makes Solomon the wealthiest man to ever live. I googled the other day, what would Solomon's net worth be in today's market? And Google said, now take it for what it's worth, Google said he would be worth $1.2 trillion. Imagine that, $1.2 trillion, which means he had everything that money could buy. But then he turns his back on God, starts living his own way, doing things the way Solomon wants to do them. And then when Solomon comes to the end of his life, he says, I've learned this. Nothing matters apart from God. I want to show you his exact words that he pins in the book of Ecclesiastes, the second chapter, starting verse 3. This is what Solomon says. At the end of his life, he says, I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom, and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens. Now, hold on to that. I made myself gardens. That's going to be important for where we're going. He said, I made for myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forests of the growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my own house. I also had great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of the kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the sons of man. Now, the Bible records that Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. So if you think that a relationship is going to give you what you are looking for, Solomon's saying, think again. I've had a thousand of them, and not one of them fulfilled my life. So I became great. And surpass all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me, and whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it, and behold, It was vanity and a striving after wind. And there was nothing to be gained under the sun. In other words, Solomon is saying, I've had it all, and it meant nothing. Because as soon as I took hold of something that I desired, I would open my hands to realize that I'm still empty. I thought a relationship would do it. But when I open my hands, I'm empty. I thought that building another house would do it, a bigger house. But I open my hands, I'm still empty. I think that a promotion will do it. But when I open my hands, I'm still empty. And he resolves this, that nothing matters apart from God. Only he can fill the void that you are feeling in your life. 
And that's where we're at in this conversation that Jesus is having with the woman at the well. It's obvious that there is a void in your life. And if you continue to come to this well to get water, you're going to get thirsty again. But if you'll come to me and ask a drink from me, I will give you this living water that will well up inside of you that will quench your thirst and your desire. You need to know that every single person in this room, every single person watching online right now, every single person who has ever walked on this planet in flesh has felt some form of a void in their life. And we all live within the vicious cycle of trying to fill the void that we have. The problem is, if we don't understand what created the void or what the void is, then we'll never know how to fill it. To, to understand this completely, to understand this void that we have, we've got to go all the way back to the beginning of time. When God created the heavens and the earth, he made a garden and he placed man and woman inside of it. Now, this is more than just a place where trees grew and plants grew and fruit was. It's, it's more just than just a lush garden. This is different because this is the place where God and man came together. This garden experience was where heaven and earth were in perfect communion. Are you tracking with me? It's important. I'm, I'm taking some time to teach today because I'm going to get into some stuff that we need to understand so that we'll stop trying to fill the void in our life with the wrong thing. So man and woman, they are placed in this perfect environment where God actually walked with them in the cool of the day. Can you imagine that? But one day, Satan shows up. And what does Satan tell them? I'll paraphrase, but he says, hey, there's something more for you outside of this garden. In other words, God has promised you a fulfilling life, but I'm letting you know there's actually something that God is trying to keep from you, and if you'll eat from this tree, you'll experience it. The problem is, when they ate of the tree that promised fulfillment, they didn't get what they thought they would get, and in this moment, they were cut off from that environment. Here's why that's important. Because before God created anything, he created an environment for it to live in. So before he creates a bird, he creates a sky for them to soar in. Before God creates a fish, what does he make? Water for the fish to swim in. Before he creates the cows and the horses, he creates a pasture for them to roam in and to feed from. Why? Because your environment matters. Turn to the person next to you and say, your environment matters. If you are in the wrong environment, you're going to malfunction and you're going to die. If you look at the selfish, it's the fastest, fastest known fish. It says that they can swim up to 68 miles per hour. That's fast. That means if you're driving down Highway 75, a fish is keeping up with most of you. Now, some of you, I know you've got a heavy foot. You're a little bit faster than they put on the sign, so maybe you're flying by the fish. But 68 miles per hour is fast. But if you take that same fish and you pull it out of the ocean and put it on dry ground, it would be beaten a race by a turtle. As a matter of fact, that fish isn't going to go very far at all. It's going to lay on the beach. and <coughs> What's happening? It's malfunctioning and it's dying. Why? Because it's not in its intended environment. You need to know that before God created man, he made an environment for them. This environment that he made for man to live in was this garden experience. Remember, the garden is more than just trees and bushes and plants. This garden is the place where heaven and earth 
are one, where God and man are one, and the presence of God is the environment that he created mankind to live in. But as soon as Adam and Eve stepped outside of that plan and decided that they were going to go find their own garden, dig their own garden, do it their own way, something was lost. The thing that was lost was that environment we were created to live in. When Jesus says, I came to seek and save that which was lost, he's come to put that environment back into place. Are you following me? So when we go to John 4, and he's having this conversation with this woman, he's letting her know, I am the way back to that garden. I am the way back to where that living water is going to flow. I am the way back to where that water will well up inside of you and nourish you and cause you to thrive. Now, when I read John 4 a few weeks ago, in my own private study, living water started jumping out at me. Because anytime the scripture uses something like that, you have to know that they're going somewhere with it. Living water, in other words, is a hyperlink. Have you ever seen a hyperlink online? Like you're reading an article, and within that article it'll say like Cameron Hallisey, and then you click that, and it hyperlinks over to who Cameron Hallisey is. And then as you're reading about Cameron Halsey, it talks about him playing guitar. And then there's a hyperlink, and that hyperlink will take you to, like, when the guitar was created. You following me with a hyperlink? So when you get to living water, you have to understand that this is a hyperlink taking you somewhere. And the first place that it took me was back to the garden. Because from the garden, the environment of God, the place where man and God were one, where they were united, where they were in perfect communion and fellowship, this place where man and God walked together and talked together, in that garden, there were these rivers that would flow out and bring life to the world around it. So that's the first thing that we need to understand is that from this garden experience is a river that flows. Then my mind took me to Ezekiel, the 47th chapter. Now, you can read Ezekiel 47 on your own, but let me just paraphrase it for you. It starts off with a temple. And from this temple, there is a river that is flowing. Then it says, from the side of the river, I mean, from the side of the temple, there was a trickling of water. Now, if you understand Scripture, your mind right then should hyperlink you now to Jesus on the cross when he was stabbed in the side. And what happened? Water started to flow. So now we see Ezekiel 47 is not talking about a building. It is talking about a man. And from this man flows from his side this trickling of water. But Ezekiel says something fascinating happens because as it trickles out, it starts to get deeper and deeper and deeper. And then it becomes this mighty rushing river that is so big that you can't even cross over it. And as this river flows out into the earth, it begins to bring life to everything that it touches. Along this river are trees that are growing and blossoming and flourishing. And if you understand scripture, you know that the Bible will compare us to trees. We're like a tree planted by what? Rivers of living water. Are you following me? Then as this river flows into the dead seas, it starts to bring about fish, and these fish begin to flourish. Now if you understand Scripture, you know that Jesus called his disciples what? Fishers of men, which makes us these fish that are flourishing by the source of this river. Are you, are you following me now? So when Jesus is talking about this river of living water, he's talking about something that is going to bring life to mankind, true life to mankind that's going to bring them back to this place where man and God are together. Again, the garden is a meeting place. The temple in Ezekiel is a meeting place, and Jesus wants us to understand he is that temple. And he invites anyone who is thirsty to come and drink. I want to show you this in in John, the seventh chapter. Again, I'm just trying to teach you the, the Bible today. Because many of us don't have a real understanding of what is happening in Scripture. And we think that Jesus came, died on a cross so that we could get to heaven. 
And if you, if you think that's what salvation is about, you've missed the story. Because salvation is not about getting you from here to heaven. Salvation is about bringing heaven to the earth. Going back to that garden experience. That's why the Bible starts with a garden. Randy, do you understand the Bible? Where does the Bible end? In a garden. Are you, are you with me this morning? In this, you're going to start to see your purpose, who you are. So watch this. In John, the seventh chapter, Jesus is at this feast. It's the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, at this feast, what they would do is they would take water and they would pour it out, and it was to represent the water that God supplied to the children of Israel when they were wandering in the wilderness. Why would water be important if you're in the wilderness? Anybody? It's hot. You get thirsty. If you don't have water, what happens to you? You die. Water's necessary. So God supernaturally provided for the children of Israel water in the wilderness. So at this feast, part of their celebration was remembering the water God supplied. And Jesus stands up in the midst of this moment while water is being poured out. And the Bible says this, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of what? Living water. Now he said this about the spirit whom those who believed him in him were to receive. This hasn't happened yet. The spirit has not been released to the people yet. But Jesus is letting them know a time is coming. It's very nearby that the spirit which will bring this living water, is about to be poured out. As for yet, the Spirit has not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. In other words, Jesus in him was the fullness of God. Jesus was the place on earth where heaven and man connected. If you go to John, the second chapter, he steps in, he's looking at the temple, the physical building, And he tells the people there, he says, if you destroy the temple, I will rebuild it in three days. And the people look at him like, you are crazy. It took us 46 years to build this temple building, and you're going to build it back in three days? But what they did not understand is Jesus was not talking about a structure. He was talking about his life. He's letting them know, I am the temple. I am the dwelling place of God. And when my body is broken, what is in me is going to be released. Are you following this? So when Jesus is taking us through this water, he's saying, if you come to me, if you're thirsty, if you believe, I will release this living water to you. But it's not just going to be a drink for you to have. It's going to be a drink that is inside of you. Are you following this? This living water is not this external experience. It's this internal thing where it's going to now well up inside of you because the temple who was him was broken so that now we become the temple of God. That's the mystery of the scripture. That is why everyone, they've been pouring through the Old Testament scriptures trying to figure out what is this all about? When is this going to happen? And Jesus comes on the scene and he says, here it is. Here's the mystery. It is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The same spirit that fills me is now going to fill you and quicken your mortal body. You're going to become an expression of the body of Christ, the temple, the dwelling place of Christ here on this earth. All right, let's go to the temple. Tabernacles built, that's the place where heaven and earth meets a temporary structure. It's not permanent. They were able to move it around. When the tabernacle is built, everything is anointed. The Bible says that the glory of God filled the tabernacle, filled the most holy place. God actually sat on his throne among his people. Above that tabernacle, there was a cloud by day and there was fire by night. 
Are you off tracking with me so far? Now fast forward to Solomon when he's the king over Israel. He has this desire to make a building. We don't need a, we don't need a tabernacle that's moving around because now we've move to this land. Let's build a permanent structure. Let's build something beautiful. Let's build something elaborate for God to fill. And so they build this temple, this permanent structure. They anoint it. Guess what happens? The glory of God falls, fills the temple. And what do you see over it? Fire. Does anybody know what today is and the significance of the church? It is Pentecost Sunday. On the day of Pentecost, when the New Testament church was meeting together, they had not yet received the Holy Spirit that Jesus had promised. He told them, hey, go wait, because you're going to receive the Spirit. The Spirit's going to give you power, okay? So now they're in this upper room experience. The sound of a mighty rushing wind fills the place, and then they begin to see tongues of what? Fire Fire resting on each of them. This is more than just a moment where it's like, oh, that's a pretty cool light show. Jesus is showing that now his true temple is filled with his spirit. You've got to get this, church. You have to understand this. You are the temple of God where the spirit of God dwells. Living water dwells inside of you. And that river that is built inside of you wants to be released through you to bring healing to the world around you. This life is more than just getting married and building a home and having a good career. All of those things are wonderful, but what this life is really about is taking the garden experiment into our world, allowing people to see the goodness of God in us so that they begin to thirst for what is inside of us and then us releasing that river, bringing hope to the hopeless, bringing light into the darkness. That's what it's all about. And people are like, well, I don't really need church to be a Christian. It's because you don't understand Scripture. We've already discovered that Jesus is what? The temple. The Bible teaches that we are members of that body. The Bible teaches that now we are the temple of the living God. Are you, are you seeing this? That means our purpose does not function as an individual, but our purpose functions as a member of that body. It's about us being an expression of who Jesus is. He's the head of this temple. He's the head of this garden, but we are members of it, releasing his nature, reflecting his nature throughout the earth. That was the whole point in the beginning when he created man and woman, placed them in the garden. He said, be fruitful, multiply, take this experience that you have and fill the earth with it. They messed up, but Jesus came and sought that which was lost in that moment, and he's brought us back to this place today to where not only are our deep needs satisfied, that void that we have is filled through the Holy Spirit if we'll just learn how to abide in him, to remain in him. Jesus says, if you'll abide in me, if you'll remain in me, you'll be fruitful because apart from me you can do nothing. But it's not just about us being well-nourished. It's about us taking this experience into the world around us. Martin, there are people that you will come into contact with that need the water that's inside of you. Heather, there are people that you come into contact with that need the water that is inside of you. And you've got to be willing to allow that river to flow. Because what does the river do? It brings life wherever it goes. Church, we are here for a purpose. Our purpose is to allow that living water that is placed inside of us to flow into the world around us and we do that as the body as the church that's why here at this church we don't use the word volunteer because a volunteer that's that's someone who's just like giving up their time to do something no no we're not volunteers we are a body of christ fulfilling our purpose and mission so we call we call people who serve in the church we call you activators That's why we do that. That's why we build this culture where we're not volunteers, we're activators, understanding that we are all members serving in the area that we have been called to serve. So when you're working, Mike, as as an usher on a Sunday morning, you're not volunteering your time. You're fulfilling your purpose in the body for that moment. 
For those of you who are serving, running cameras and switchers or live stream or people working with our kids or the hosting, whatever it is that you do, you're not volunteering your time. You're saying, I am a part of the body and I'm going to be an expressive member. I'm going to work and do something because I understand that it is through me that Christ is revealed to the earth. If you'll catch this, that will change the way you live. Because you'll understand that every day of your life is an opportunity to reveal Jesus to your world. When I talk about through this series, you're made for more. That's what I'm talking about. You're made to carry the presence of God. Who will not only satisfy your deep needs, but who will use you as a connection point to bring water to thirsty people. Well, that's the end of our online experience, but listen, your journey is not over. We believe that God has a purpose, a plan, and a destiny just for you. And we've put together some resources here on our YouTube channel that we believe will help you step into that future He has for you. So take a moment, look around, let us know what you think. And if you have a prayer request, please send it to info at activationonline.org because we would love to pray with you. Well, until next week, have a wonderful day.